Over the Pelicans' four-game winning streak, one player, not named Zion Williamson or Brandon Ingram, may have made himself untradeable. I'll tell you who that is in today's episode of Locked On Pelicans. Let's go. You are Locked On Pelicans, your daily New Orleans Pelicans podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to another edition of Locked On Pelicans, the daily podcast covering your favorite team, the New Orleans Pelicans and NBA, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, available wherever you get your podcasts and available on YouTube. I'm your host, Pelicans Insider, credential member of the media, Jake Madison, at Nola Jake on Twitter, here with y'all on this Monday, tipping off a week's worth of shows, and we do it with the Pelicans riding a four-game winning streak with some winnable games coming up too. Can they extend it? We'll break that down in tomorrow's show. But I want to look at Jonas Valanciunas to open today's show, a guy who might be untradeable now, which after spending an offseason talking about trading him is a little wild to say, but his play's been really good and he's actually more integral to this team than you realize. And we're going to break it down. Plus, we'll look at the three point shooting and the win over the San Antonio Spurs and talk in general about the four game winning streak here for the Pelicans. And of course, thank you for making Lockdown Pelicans your first listen today and every day. We are free, available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Become an everyday or listen Monday through Friday. Support the channel that way. For you, listen one day a week, listen two days a week. Become closer to being an everyday. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA and use code all lowercase locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. So let's get into Jonas Valanciunas. He was the hero for the Pelicans in their win on Friday over the Charlotte Hornets. Ingram had a very off night in that game. We'll get into Brandon Ingram in the next segment, too, because he had a strong bounce back game against the San Antonio Spurs. But he was just three of eight, seven assists, which is good, but nine turnovers and eight total points. That's kind of wild. More turnovers than points scored. Zion did some work down low, scored, was aggressive on the glass, 21 points for him. But it was Jonas Valanciunas who led the way. He was 11 for 16. That's 69 nice percent. Mm -hmm. Two of four from three, including a big three to kind of equal what Terry Rozier was doing for the Charlotte Hornets, and then grabbed 13 boards, gave you four assists, and route to 29 points. You know, against the San Antonio Spurs, another workmanlike night where he didn't need to play significant minutes, but 15 points, 15 boards. Just flat out, Jonas Valanciunas has been very good for the Pelicans, and this is something that's interesting to think about with how they've used him this year and how well he has played and he's averaging 14.6 points per game this season and basically 9.5 10 rebounds per but I think he's been very key for what they're looking to do he's also averaging 2.4 assists which is the second highest number of his career They're using him in very creative ways. And when you look at how reliable he is on a night-to-night basis, Zion going to play, is Brandon Ingram going to play, CJ going to play, are you going to get good games for them or are they not? You almost never have to worry about Jonas Valanciunas. Just as reliable as it gets. And he's also a guy that can go out and just win games for you. Like against the Charlotte Hornets. He did against Charlotte last year too to open the season. So when you have a guy that can do all of this, You know, it's tough to want to trade him. And I get why we spent, and I did it too, looking at trades for him. We were looking at Miles Turner. We were looking at Jared Allen with the Cavs. We're going to get a good look at in the next couple of days. But now maybe you don't trade Jonas Valanciunas. So this comes from a couple of places. You know, one, I don't think any of those other guys are truly available right now. Maybe the Cavs and Jared Allen, depending on what they want to do with the injuries, they got hit by the injury bug hard in the past week. But if they still don't want to move anybody, I mean, you're, you have Jonas Valanciunas there, and he isn't a bad player. You know, one of the things that I had said that, you know, we had said on the show here, if you're an everydayer, is, you know, Jonas Valanciunas isn't a bad player. In fact, he's probably an underrated center. He just doesn't exactly fit at the time what the Pelicans were looking to do, what they were doing. 
you know, they want to run. Willie Green said it after the game against, I forget if it was Charlotte or the San Antonio Spurs of, yeah, we got to run. We got to play with pace. That's what we want to be doing. Jonas doesn't fit that mold. He's trying. He's certainly trying, but he's not like a space and pace kind of center, right? As the league goes smaller, the Jonas Valanciunas of the world, you know, don't exactly fit in, but are still key pieces and guys that you want to have on your team. But they're using him in ways that work within the offense. One of the numbers that I've really looked at with him is the assist numbers this season. In fact, let me look up. Let me see if I can do this quickly here while we're doing the show. I should have thought of this during my prep work here. So I apologize for doing that. Um, but I have a question about hustle stats. What about screen assists? Where does, you know, oh, of course, the NBA stats website doesn't want to work right now. What about screen assists? Because those are actually like a great number here. And I wouldn't be shocked if he was, okay, he's not that high on there. That's kind of annoying. Anyway, oh, here's the numbers. That's the number that I'm looking for. Let's see. We're going to do this in real time. Nope, that's not what I want. Let's see. He's averaging three screen assists per game, which is actually a pretty decent number. Okay, so the segment's going to go along now because of that. Sorry. So he's averaging, you know, 2.4 assists per game, but also four screen assists per game. That's leading to about eight points per game. 6.3 points per game is what he's giving you based off of the screen assists that he's giving you. Those are good numbers. So if you think about the regular assists being a minimum, right? 2.4, so at two, that's five points. And then 6.3 points from screen assists. This is a guy who's giving you about 11 other points per game than just what he's scoring based on his like body and what he's doing. That's pretty cool to see. I think those are really strong numbers from him here. They've found ways to use him in the offense that work with the rest of the players. One of the things that I've talked about, particularly in that first home game against the Sacramento Kings, was dribble handoffs. Jonas has the ball. He's just using his body, puts the ball out there. Zion curls around him, gets the ball, starts going downhill. Those are actions that work. Dribble handoffs are very big in the NBA right now, and those type of actions can spring guys like Zion Williamson. So when you have Jonas Valanciunas creating and being worked into the offense that way and creating space, which he's not a floor spacer, just basically with his body, because he's a big dude holding the ball out, there's space there now. It works. Like, he's being somewhat integral to this team and I don't know if you can move him now at least not for a downgrade just to save money I think if you were to trade him away that would be a you know in a salary dump and when you look at guys that they could trade at the trade deadline to duck under the luxury tax Tim and Kyra Lewis Jr. maybe you know the guys that you're like well like they get rid of them I don't think you can do that with Jonas Valanciunas right now I think he's too important to the team. He works within the flow of his offense. One of the things if you're an everydayer we talked about last week was like winning your minutes, right? Jonas Valanciunas is fourth best at that for the Pelicans. Trey Murphy, Jose Alvarado, Najee Marshall, then Jonas Valanciunas. You know, and Jonas has played the most minutes by far out of all of those guys. And he's winning his minutes when he's out there on the court. You know, more so than Zion, more so than Brandon Ingram, more so than Herb Jones, right? That really tells you something about how well he is playing and how important he is and how well he's working within everything. I think, particularly when you watched him in that Charlotte game, basically win it because of him, he might be untradeable at this point and they might look if they're going to dump salary that they need to do that another way. That could be good or bad. I'm not entirely sure yet for the Pelicans. We'll talk about it at some point on Locked on Pelicans. But let me know what you think. Do you think Jonas Valanciunas is untradeable with how well that he's been playing? Let me know in the comments down below. So coming up next, let's look at the three-point shooting from the win over the San Antonio Spurs. Some interesting comments from guys on the team, too, that I want to probably read a little too much into, but I think it's worth looking at. And that's coming up here next in today's episode of Locked On Pelicans. Right now, though, I'm excited to tell you about Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy sports made easy, and it's the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America and the most exciting way to play DFS. It's just you versus the numbers. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros, sharks, you pick more or less on two to six players and their stats projection, and then you just watch the winning roll in. And with basketball season and football season both underway, you can take Jonas Valanciunas and Travis Kelsey at a 10.5 combo of three-pointers made and receptions. He made two 
the other night. And they offer a reboot policy, so your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half, doesn't return in the second, the player is rebooted. PrizePix is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. So go to prizepix.com slash LockedOnNBA. Use code LockedOnNBA for a first-time deposit match up to $100 Again, that is a first-time deposit match up to $100 free money right there. Uh, go to prizepicks.com slash LockedOnNBA. Use promo code LockedOnNBA. PrizePicks, it's daily fantasy sports made easy. And thank you for making Locked On Pelicans your first listen today and every day. We are here Monday through Friday for y'all, breaking down everything you want to know about this Pelicans team, the number one Pelicans podcast out there. Becoming every day. We are here Monday through Friday, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Subscribe, listen Monday through Friday, become an every day. If you're an every day, let me know in the comments down below on YouTube. So let's get into the three point shooting from the San Anto- the win over the San Antonio Spurs, right? They beat, I should probably have mentioned the scores 112 107 win over Charlotte. Jonas Valchun is the key in that one. San Antonio Spurs, that's a bad team and good for the Pelicans for going out and blowing the doors off of them. We'll talk about beating bad teams coming up in the next segment. 146, whoo. 110 over the Spurs. Gotta love that. A big reason for it was they took 42 three-pointers, made 22 of them. You know, we mentioned that Brandon Ingram did not have a good game against the Charlotte Hornets. He had an amazing game against the San Antonio Spurs. Five of seven from three. In the first quarter alone, he made three three three-pointers. Was three of three, and it just opened his game up so much. Finished with 26 points on the night, 5 of 7, and it just seemed to push the Pelicans forward in everything that they were trying to do when it came to three-point shooting. Just blew the San Antonio Spurs out, right? You didn't even need guys to play that much. Zion, just 15 points here. Only 25 minutes. It was the three-point shooting that really did it. This is what you want to see. You know, They need to shoot more threes. Brandon Ingram needs to shoot more threes. I think Ingram is having a good season. He's been very good driving and attacking the basket. His mid-range works, but when you can get him on the three-point line, taking those threes, taking them at volume, five attempts, or sorry, seven attempts is a lot, making five of them is great. It just opens his game up so much more. You know, after the game, CJ McCollum was talking to Jen Hale and you had Larry Nance Jr. kind of in the background messing with him. And he had a sneaky comment, you know, where Larry Nance Jr. comes up and he's like, let's not talk about CJ's three point shooting. He was six of seven, by the way, for 29 points. He was like, he's our starting point guard. He only had two assists here. And CJ goes, we shoot so many tough twos. It's hard to get assists. That's a telling comment when you've got one of the best mid range shooter on your team. And that's not a shot at Brandon Ingram. Don't think of it like that. But those are some of the toughest shots in the NBA, period. They just don't go in at a high rate compared to shorter or even threes. You know, there's a stat I use that I like that you'll hear people use and that I like, you know, and it's E field goal percentage. It's different than just the regular field goal percentage, right? One of the things to look at with Brandon Ingram is these numbers, right? He's shooting from the field 49.3% from the season. He's shooting... This isn't the best number here, but it's getting better. 29.5% from three. Here's the thing, though. A three-pointer is worth more than a two. So 50% from two-point range is what, right? That's one point per shot if you're shooting it at 50%. Does that make sense? You're going to get half of that based off the field goal percentage. A three-pointer is worth three. So 50% from two is the equivalent of shooting 33% from three. It's worth keeping that in mind that if when you start to see those numbers kind of be equal, we'll take the one that's worth more. And when you look at mid-rangers versus, especially long mid-rangers versus three-pointers, that's when the math starts to kind of come into this, right? You know, if you look at it here last season, Brandon Ingram on 16 feet to the three-point line shot 37.5%. You know, we can do the math on what that is per per shot attempt, right? Two times 0.375. 0.75. That's 0.75 points per shot attempt, right? He shot 39% from three last year. So it's three times 0.339. And that's 1.17. Which shot should he be taking? 
right? The one that gives you 0.75 or the one that gives you 1.17. So again, when he starts shooting threes, it elevates this team so much by making them more efficient. They go in at a higher rate. And that is just going to make the team better. It also then lets him attack the basket more. That forces closeouts, which is actually going to give him more space on his mid-range jumper. Then you just go by the guy, elevate, shoot, and make it. So when he's doing this, he's making his bread and butter shot, the mid-ranger, which he wants, even better. And at that point, he becomes unstoppable. So when his game is going and feeding into it like this, Everything works. It gives space to Zion. It gives space to Jonas Valanciunas, right? It's even going to allow a guy like CJ McCollum to get downhill and attack more. He didn't just make threes in this game. He was attacking the basket, and he doesn't always do that. And it just opens things up so much more for everybody here. So this team does need to take more threes. They've put a point of emphasis on that. 22 is a franchise record for threes made. You know, 146 is the second most points they've ever scored in a game. They are on fire right now, and it started with that three-point shooting. They normally take 30 and a half per game. That's 27th in the league. That number needs to go up. 42 is a good number. You make 22 of them, yeah. So they're starting to find things. Willie Green after the game said, like, guys are buying into what we're doing. They realize who we want to be. They're sacrificing and changing a little bit. Brandon Ingram. Adding more threes, more games like this is going to be bigger games for him. It's just going to make him a better player, and this team's going to win more games because they need him shooting threes. Because Valanciunas isn't always going to take four or even make one or two. You know, Zion's not going to take any threes. Herb at times is a little scared to shoot threes. So you need CJ to do it. But other guys have been good, to, or not CJ, Brandon Ingram. CJ was good, right? One of the other things that's helped them this season with this is Najee was three of four from deep in this one. He had a timely answer. Jose Alvarado was three of five. Both of those guys are shooting well from three this season. That hasn't always been the case. Najee Marshall is shooting 42.6% from three on 2.8 attempts per game. That's... Second best other than Matt Ryan for players who have played like significant minutes or more than, you know, like 10 games, essentially. Jose Alvarado is shooting 41% from three. 3.3 attempts per game. So it's not insanely high volume, but those are good numbers. That means they can stay in the rotation. When we looked at the rotation in last week's show, right, of should Hawkins play more? Well, not if Najee's going to shoot well, not if Jose's going to play and shoot well, right? If those guys are making their shots... No, you don't, you know, right now need Hawkins in your winning games. Those guys are winning their minutes with the bench. Things are rolling well for New Orleans, and I want to keep it going that way. And if B.I. can take more threes, that's a really great thing. He had a fantastic game in this one. The confidence he showed, you know, taking those threes, then being able to get to the rim, then hitting mid-rangers, things like that. It just opens his game so much for everybody else. Loved what we saw them taking care of business against the San Antonio Spurs. In fact, they took care of business the whole road trip, right? They just went 3-0. and Love it. Four-game winning streak. Let's talk about that, put it in proper context. That's coming up here next in today's episode of Locked on Pelicans. Right now, though, I'm excited to tell you about FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. So as the weather gets colder, the NBA offers stay hot on FanDuel. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. If you bet the Pelicans on the money line, you get to win that bet and $150 in bonus bets. So if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is super easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, which is what I'm looking for. Spreads, player props, over-unders, more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get in on the NBA action you want this season. FanDuel, it's an official partner of the NFL and the official sportsbook of Locked On. And thank you for making Locked On Pelicans your first listen today and every day. We're here Monday through Friday, the number one Pelicans podcast coming to you like nobody else does. 
Locked On's coming to you like nobody else does. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. And of course, become an everydayer of Locked On Pelicans. Listen Monday through Friday. If you're an everydayer, let me know in the comments down below. So the Pelicans are on a 14-game winning streak now, beating some bad teams along the way. You know what? You know what I say to that? Or anyone who wants to kind of take away from what the Pelicans are doing right now? Don't care. The Pelicans are 15-11 and in a very tough Western Conference. Good teams, good teams beat the teams they're supposed to beat. It's an 82-game schedule. You're going to lose an odd game here or there, like, say, to the Chicago Bulls. But, but, you know what? You beat the bad teams for the most part. And so to go 3-0 and on this road trip, really 4-0 when you factor in playing the Minnesota Timberwolves who didn't have Anthony Edwards in that one, that's exactly what a good team should do. That is exactly what a good team should do. How many times have we said the Pelicans played down to their competition in years past? Even this year, all the time. They didn't play down to the level of competition against the Washington Wizards. They did, you know, Charlotte was a little bit harder, but the Pelicans got the W there. And then you just really blew out the San Antonio Spurs. Stack these wins as much as you can. One, because this is the easy part of the schedule, and we looked at it at the beginning of the year. You looked at this stretch and go, okay, they better win these games. And I said on this show, if they don't go 2-1 and one on this road trip or even 3-0, and oh, we need to have a serious conversation about the ceiling for this team. You know, I don't know if this is a response to the Lakers' loss, 44 points, a reaction to the Lakers' loss, or just this team coming together, or, as I often say, a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. You know, I think it could be both. But I do think when you're seeing this team beat these admittedly bad teams, but doing it in dominant fashion in the way they should be winning in doing things, I do think there was a little bit, in terms of media fans, all that of an overreaction to that Lakers loss. Bad losses happen. Kind of as simple as that. And this team was starting to play well. Guys were winning their minutes, and they were finally healthy. So now that they are, look at that. Look at what they're capable of doing. You know, you have the... Memphis Grizzlies on Tuesday, a TNT game. John Morant might return, but then you're on the road to Cleveland. You, that's a winnable game with the injuries they have. You're at home against Houston, right? At home against Memphis then. Again, you can do that. Then at home against Utah. These are all winnable games. You know, I'm not going to say they're going to go on one, two, three, four. You get five winnable games before you get to the New Year's Eve game against um, the Lakers. I'm not going to say they're going to go 5 and 0 oh from here, but if you can go 4 and 1, even if you go 3 and 2, right? You're looking to be very good here. If you go 3 and 2, you're 6 and 2 in your last 8 games at that point. Actually, it'd be if you count this the 3 here from the road trip, you'd add one more win so you could be 7 and 2 in your last 9. That looks even better. This team is starting to come together. You're seeing why people believed in this team. They keep the three-point shooting up that they showed against the San Antonio Spurs. You wonder what like the ceiling for this team could be. You know, they again, I think that Lakers loss was more of an outlier than not. I don't think that was the norm. Is this team trying or maybe? I also think they're just figuring things out and they've gotten healthy at the right time and it coincides with an easier schedule. So go and do your job. And they are. This is exactly what you should be doing. The end of the season schedule is tough, so you've got to get these wins down. And again, they're not playing down to the level of competition. They're blowing out some of these teams that blew out the Wizards. They really blew out the San Antonio Spurs. It's exactly what you want to see from a growing team. You know, Zion, again, I think has been good. I think the criticism was a little bit overblown and too much in that moment. There's valid things to criticize about him. I thought that was a little heavy-handed and too much and just everybody literally just piling on when actually he's been good and that's an outlier of a game. And again, you lost by 44 points to the Lakers. That one wasn't solely on Zion. Nobody was good in that game. Maybe Herb Jones was like the only one that tried. So... If that's the case, 
look at this team for really what they are, taking care of business. I think we'll have a very good idea by the end of December of who the Pelicans are and what they can do going forward, particularly how they play in that New Year's Eve game against the Los Angeles Lakers. If they come out and are like, we, you know, we want revenge and they have like an edge to them. Oh, this team has found something in them, some sort of fight that they didn't have before. And that's exactly what we want to see. We'll find out. Look, Memphis on Tuesday is going to be kind of tough, especially if, and I think it's, I don't know if it's confirmed yet, John Morant's returning or not. We'll find out. It's going to be a lot of fun. I can't wait. TNT game, national TV. We'll be coming to you soon after that one ends to talk about it, good or bad. We'll have a show tomorrow. I want to look at Trey Murphy, the growth of his game, Pelicans getting to the rim, the uh, free throws and stuff that they do as well. So we'll have a great show for you tomorrow. So make sure you are an everydayer because we are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Jake Madison, at Nola Jake on Twitter. I'll be back with y'all tomorrow.